It is race week. (laughs) It is race week. I feel like we've been waiting forever to say that, but it's finally race week. I think that the off season felt longer than like some of the other sports I watch where they're only on for half the year. F1 is on for 10 months of the year and the two months it wasn't on, I was like, give me my racing back. There's also an unbelievable amount of news in the last like month of the off season that kind of like flipped our world upside down and then back again. So it somehow was like, how is this it made waiting for the season to start like just kind of get me more apprehensive i'm ready to actually see the real pace of these cars now mm-hmm. we've gone through testing i am ready to look at some fp2 data to see some quality lap time some race pace i you know i'm ready to see max verstappen win his first race of the season like let's go let's do this season Recording from New York and Los Angeles, your hosts, Nicole Katz and Brianna Klein, are lined up on the grid for this week's Grid Walk. Engines are fired up, ready to broadcast to you every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and more. Subscribe, like the video, turn on auto downloads, and leave a review to provide us with a fresh set of tires. Today, Grid Walk will take pit stops at... This is your first race weekend preview episode of Gridwalk. Uh, We are going to start the show discussing all the latest news about the Christian Horner sexual harassment investigation. Um, As we said the first time, if that is upsetting or triggering to you in any way, know that there are always time codes in our description, and we will not be offended if you want to skip ahead to the segment after that. But we feel like it is important to talk about uh, going into the first race weekend of the year. After that, we are going to dramatically shift gears and we are going to do a segment of Overheated where we give you all of our hot takes going into the first race weekend of the year. So after all that preseason testing, is McLaren going to be good? Uh, Is Haas gonna be the slowest car or will someone else be the slowest car? Will Alpine even make it to Q2? Cause right now I'm not sure they're even gonna show up with a car based on how doom and gloom everyone is. Will both RB Junior cars score points? And we're gonna talk about whether we think any of the teams have a chance of being within a half a second of Red Bull during qualifying. That and all of our hot takes going into the season. F1 Academy has been putting on a masterclass of introducing new exciting sponsors for their season. So we're gonna talk about why F1 Academy sponsors feel so fun. Everything from the rollout of them to the brands themselves. Well, all of F1 has been in one place for a little over a week now, which means we got the first comments from every interested party and every non-interested party and basically any human walking around the paddock made a comment about Lewis Hamilton moving to Ferrari. So we're gonna react to the first week of everyone reacting. We finally heard from Lewis, we heard from Toto, we heard from everyone in the Ferrari camp. There's a lot to discuss about the lame duck year that everyone is going into. And last, but most definitely not least, for you, for me, for everyone pretty much except Nicole. Well, we did predictions for all of last season of F1. And at the end, Nicole lost. I won the competition, which means that Nicole did her Bahrain GP predictions from an ice bath. So stay tuned to see how that went down, as well as I, I'll give my predictions too, but I don't have to do them from an ice bath. So I think we're mostly excited to hear Nicole's predictions for the Bahrain GP. And with that, take it away, voiceover man. It's lights out and away we go on this week's grid walk. Uh, obviously we look very different right now because since we recorded the rest of this episode, as predicted, Red Bull has given us the results of their investigation. Um, we had a fantastic segment filmed about Red Bull, like really making a stand for like having a good culture and like holding people accountable. That is honestly was laughable to listen back to now. So instead we're recording a different segment right now. So let me give you the Red Bull statement first in case you uh, just need a refresher. I think it's important context for what Nicole and I are about to share. So Red Bull statement was very short. The independent, the, <laughs> Mm -hmm. and I will stumble through it. And I'm just going to like, you know what? Uh, The independent investigation into the allegations made against Mr. Horner is complete. And Red Bull can confirm that the grievance has been dismissed. Mentally bookmark that we're coming back to it. The complaint has the right of appeal. 
Red Bull is confident that the investigation has been fair, rigorous, and impartial. The investigation report is confidential and contains the private information of the parties and third parties who assisted in the investigation. And therefore, we will not be commenting out of further respect for all concerned. Red Bull will continue striving to meet the highest workplace standards. Now, I'm just going to hit a couple things, even though I know Nicole is ready to scream. So thing number one, they can say it's an independent investigation all they want, but Red Bull paid to bring in an attorney that they are paying. So therefore, it is not independent, even though they want to say that because it was done by an outside organization. This not is something impartial, that, not impartial, right. not In, impartial. Independent and impartial have two very different definitions. Like independent solely means that it was by someone who is not in the Red Bull organization, but Red Bull did pay for them. Therefore, they are not impartial. The second thing is dismissing a grievance is very different than being proven innocent or clearing someone's name. Dismissed, cleared, innocent are all three words with three very, 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 very different uh, definitions to them. And then the last thing I'm going to say is that if he was innocent or cleared and there really wasn't an issue, why would they be so concerned about keeping the report private? Because um, the last, like my my understanding is that not, there is nothing powerful men in particular love more than having a victory lap of, fuck you, I was innocent all along. And if that was the case, why would Red Bull release the shortest statement ever saying they will not give us any more information about everything, everyone should drop it. Uh, adding on the fact that we know that Horner was like attempted to pay off the victim to make her go away. Like the, d Red Bull dismissing it. All, of, all of this statement says is Red Bull doesn't want to fire the team principal and the CEO of their racing team. That's it. This has nothing to do with innocence. He was not in a, he was not tried in a court. Yeah. It's one of those days that I'm very thankful that we have these like aggressive marketing brains because statements like this, you really have to, to pay attention to and specifically look at the word choice. Yup. Like the dismiss cleared, not the same as, you know, it's, it's, they're completely different. It's a different message and they're, it's very purposeful. You don't release statements. The statement is literally specific chosen words to like show your stance. And Red Bull did a fantastic job of picking a lot of words that said not a lot. And so much, right. it said so much about, their intention, their purpose, what they really wanted to do. And really, to me, at least unveiled like, yep, okay, it's done. Now everyone can like shut up and get over it. Like that's, it, it just seemed, it, it seemed like fake. It seemed like they were checking a thing off of a to-do list. It did not feel like anything was done due diligently. The non releasing of evidence. Yeah. To your point of the whole like victory lap where you know you want to show off receipts that proved you were innocent i'd love to see it but i don't believe you it it's it was just it like such a lazy it it's a lazy statement that took so much like attention you know the the whole thing screamed how can we get away like this entire process felt like, oh, well, we're not going to suspend him. We're going to have him at every team event possible. Like, how can we get away with not having to fire this man who clearly did something wrong? Like, how much can the public let us get away with? And it is, I know that this they wanted this cleared up before the race weekend. And I honestly, like the whole thing has left me. I was so excited. You're going to watch the rest of this episode, hopefully. And you're going to see two people who were so excited for racing to come back and race weekend to be here. And I don't want to watch any of it because I am so upset and disheartened by how this was all handled. Right. And I think handled is the right word because it literally, the whole thing just makes me want to like throw up. We're recording this right now. We're releasing an episode because we release an episode every week. And I think it's important that we give our opinions on this. But I need to be honest. The absolute last thing I want to do is think about F1 or the fact or watch the race this weekend. Like I don't, I have zero interest in 
in it right now. And I don't think this is over because the interesting thing is that this is one team and there are nine other teams in the sport and a giant media conglomerate that had dubbed this man a face of the sport. But that was, you know, what we talked about in a really interesting segment that we now have to chuck out, which is that like Christian Warner is one of five faces of this sport right now. And now we're saying that this is okay. And yeah. Like, the, yeah. Social media has been a massive cesspool today where I have just felt unwelcome and unsafe because it's so many men doing victory laps about how it's like okay to sexually harass women and it just makes me want to cry. All of this just makes me want to cry because I, I thought that we were at a place where we were better than this and that maybe that was me being naive. Yeah, it's a, again, it's word, cho it's word choice, it's response. There's so many ways that Red Bull could have, like, responded. You know, like, if we even want to look in the place of, like, he was found innocent based on actual evidence, whatever. If that, right, But they would have right. said that. But you would have said it. Exactly. Right. Like, it, it's, it, that's, that's kind of, like, the point of it all here was that, like, if they, the, the statement made today was so unbelievably shady that it then felt like it could instigate like all of the ugly things that I have also seen online. You have also seen online. It gives a very bad taste in my mouth, like going into like the first race weekend, given especially that it's Red Bull and he's going to be everywhere. And that's gross. It's, it's super icky. I, I, and in our chucked out content, I had said, you know, I'm already preparing myself for the statement of all is fine and he's still here, yet it was worse than I had tried to prepare myself for. It was right. just, yeah. Because the Red Bull, because it all goes back to, like, I, sorry if I sound like a broken record. If he was innocent, they would have put out a giant statement about him being innocent. And they would have plastered it everywhere. And what's been so infuriating to me is to watch F1 media read that statement and then put out giant headlines about how he's cleared, he's innocent. Like the amount of graphics I've seen from reputable news sources that just have his face and innocent. And that is so frustrating and disheartening because it's just an inaccurate statement. Nothing Red Bull said, said innocent. And so now we have like the F1 media going through this like buzzing of, oh, well, he's like, let's just all put out that he's innocent and then the general then that gives mostly men the freedom to be awful about this online. And it's just like this, it, it feels so icky and gross. Like the whole circus around it feels so gross because it's not, there's no one, there's no one out there vocalizing except for like women online being like, please read what's actually going on. Like, I'm kind of having like a, a fourth wall <laughs> moment right now. And if you decide to keep this in the edit, that's fine. But even while recording this part of my brain, and like, you know, we don't, we talk about like, leave us comments and things, but like we, we get nasty comments. Like we get nasty <laughs> comments on our content and our show. And one of the things I'm very much thinking about while we're recording this is, you know, someone going in and being like, you don't you're just angry women and, and so it'll be there and it, i expect it and it'll be there and especially because we've seen it all over the place it, it, it's you know just preparing myself that I, I, we're just going to be told that we're emotional and silly and dumb when our feelings are justified and it's all it's look at the evidence we are given and exactly what's being said to us and like making our own interpretation yeah like and the reason we're even talking about it for that reason is because one i have like, this delusional hope that maybe like one person is listening to this conversation and it's like you're right i didn't think about the statement that way and it doesn't say innocent or cleared in the statement it says dismissed and like maybe they'll start thinking critically about about it because I think there's a big difference between like I think most of the people who actually listen to our content and like our content are like smart people and mm -hmm. they might be like oh I didn't think about it that way because they're you know not keeping up with social media or maybe a lot of people are like wow for my own mental health like me most of the day I can't be on social media hearing people talk about this and this might be the first time they're hearing someone talk about this and you know if that's the case I hope we're helping but you know there's a reason on our YouTube channel and on our social media channels that we have a comment policy and it was important to both of us when we started that our comment sections are safe place for people to have discourse, which is why we have that comment policy. So, you know, to the person who's already clicked off of this, who left the nasty comment, like they won't be there anymore in our comments because I purposely go through and delete it because I like there are so few like this is our platform, which means that the comment space underneath our platform, you can leave the comment and I can delete it. 
<laughs> which is like the if yeah. only we could delete Red Bull's entire statement and just forget it existed. That's just now circling just, back to the yeah the cause actual of topic why we're here. I just I am hopeful because at this point we haven't had any actual on track running or anything. It's Wednesday for context. I'm in the middle of editing the rest of this podcast for tomorrow. But the I need F one and like like F one is a conglomerate and the per, the media production this weekend to not go into PR spin mode. I would, I need, like, I don't think this is over. Like, there are nine other teams that care about their brand value. And F1's in a teetering place right now. We're in the middle of extreme dominance, conveniently from the team that did something wrong. They have a fan base that's made up a large percentage by very young women who, hmm, guess what, probably don't love this so much. Like, I need to see what every other team and what F1 chooses to do and how they choose to handle it over the course of this weekend before I, like, really form thoughts but like beyond like this makes me unbelievably upset i wish there was better media literacy and i want to puke yeah but uh it definitely is important that we give and gave our you know initial first responses because the rest of this episode is a lot of fun and it just <laughs> as much as we didn't want to record this and acknowledge this i felt again it's this is our platform and our space of what we want to acknowledge and we want to talk about how we're feeling and this felt gross right. so i will be in torture if it is some like ugly pr spin of media all weekend and i'll probably watch a lot less of the commentary and uh you know it will go probably be on mute pro- yeah. yep be throwing some things on mute so uh that'll be interesting stay tuned for some interesting superlatives it- on sunday <laughs> it's been a while since we've actually had a really serious conversation like this on the podcast so you know you're at this point listening in the segment i do want to throw out there that like our dms are open and we are like we are a safe space if you want to um, vent some frustrations with some people who are also frustrated um this is an offer exclusively to um she they them you know not if you you do you know those those categories of people who want to be uh, so anyone is feeling down and out and like, just yes. like really like bad about the universe like like given this circumstance you know, and if you that's... need you know if you need a, a two other f1 fans who are also upset uh are you know feel free to come talk to us about it oh this episode comes out on the leap year that's fun it does happy birthday dad grid walk please beware of overheating your tires with your hot takes so I feel like we need to uh, put up the sign again, which is the Charlotte Claire, it's just testing, we don't know sign. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to attempt to make some hot, hot takes about topics that we've seen lots of people talking about going into the first race and into the season as a whole, because there's a variety of opinions and none of them really backed up by fact. So this is the perfect time for this segment, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's, but yeah, we don't know. Uh, really anything going into because like you know free it's testing could just be a whole bunch of sandbagging or who knows what and we're just going to be going in and making a bunch of takes and uh not a whole bunch to go off of so it's really fun this is extra time extra fun time to do some hot takes i'm realizing it's the perfect time for me to debut this sweater because i'm wearing magic eight balls and i really do feel like with some things we could just literally shake the magic eight ball and, be like, and figure out this gonna happen <sighs> Starting with, Nicole, do you think McLaren will be a top three car on the grid? No, I don't. I do not feel like McLaren is coming in. We've talked about it. I don't feel like there's uh, much momentum coming in there. And part of my brain was starting to think how last year they were doing the whole, oh, we were worried about our upgrades thing and or and this will be coming now i kind of feel like it's like flip the script we've been like whatever it takes they are doing this big whatever it takes campaign because it's like we're it's a long-term investment so they don't want to be coming out and doing the upgrade thing it's like it's whatever it takes and we're committed to the cost i feel like so many of the quotes though as we got later and later into testing though did start to sound like last year and I 100% agree that McLaren won't be a top three car if you average out the first couple of races of the season. Who knows when upgrades start coming? And by the time we hit Japan, 
you know, apparently Red Bull is going to have a completely different RB20 by Japan. So who knows? But <laughs> the people are saying the wildest things right now. Yeah, but, but McLaren needed to get all of their exciting announcements out and get people really, really excited first so that it like levels out and right. goes down. So now we're like, yeah, we saw the livery a month and a half ago. And now the race <laughs> is starting. So we're like, okay, we're kind of just at a, eh. <laughs> it's whatever yeah. it takes though. So they'll climb up and come back. But no, I'm, I'm not seeing it. I didn't feel like there was much to go off of. And even at testing, you know, we didn't necessarily see anything unlock and be like incredibly special unless sandbagging you know what they add a sign underneath the charles leclerc testing sign of just like sandbagging shrug <laughs> or just bad like <laughs> well i think there it's an interesting world right now when you examine pundits and experts and what everyone's saying because i think there are two camps there's the oh mclaren is definitely going to be a top three speed car at the start of the season and then there's the Oh, I don't know. I think we should be really worried about McLaren camp. And I mean, the, me doing a bad job as a F1 podcaster, I don't know. It's probably somewhere in the middle. Like everything's probably not a disaster and they're probably not going to be the ones competing with Red Bull. Uh, but for the purpose of the segment, I don't think McLaren is going to be fast enough to be a top three car. And if they are, it's because everyone else really dropped the ball. Like the, there are no positive reports or quotes really being given from anyone in McLaren. Lando doesn't seem happy right now as someone who just signed a very long-term contract with this team. Like this is not, this is not positive vibe central <laughs> coming mm -hmm. out of McLaren camp. Yeah, it's definitely, I think, not where they wanted to be or maybe they did expect and this was just now all management, but it's, yeah. Kind of not looking like it's going to be the prettiest start at the beginning, but we'll see on Saturday. It's confusing. Sat yeah. Yeah. Friday for quality, Saturday for the race. By the way, you probably have heard it 7 million times, but for the first two races of the season, the race is on a Saturday. <laughs> For the first, and then because of Australia, it's actually on a Saturday for us again. But that's because of time zones and not because of, like, it's actually on a Saturday for Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. Right. Um, but I really do feel like this is the moment where I need to, and, like, go back to what I've been saying, which is that, like, if McLaren did come out of the gates, it w was going to be because everyone else dropped the ball, like they are not built with the facilities and as a customer team in order to beat the Mercedes and the Ferrari and the Red Bulls of the world. And Alpine doesn't count as a non-customer team because Alpine's a mess. And we'll get to that later. But I think, I always thought it was an unreasonable expectation that McLaren was going to be the car competing with Red Bull. Like and To me, this all feels like McLaren, McLaren regressing to the norm, if this is true. Drops mic. Haas be the slowest car, or will someone be slower than Haas? I think Haas being the slowest car was the betting favorite coming into the season. So based on everything we've seen from testing so far, will Haas be the slowest car? I still want to go with yes. Like I I I just I I'm I'm still going with yes. I don't I haven't seen anything at least, you know, coming from Haas that gives me hope for i mean at least in terms of also like reliability issues too like let's let's see if we're gonna have at least one or both crossing the finish line <laughs> yeah, low bar <laughs> so can you both finish the race after yeah, everything maybe. that happened last season i i don't think it is out of the question that haas ends this race weekend as the P8 or P9 constructors. I think there are enough other teams around them that seem to be sim in a similar messy place that they could end up not being the slowest team, which if you ask me coming into preseason testing, I would have been like, no, absolutely P10, slowest team, not even a question. I left it being like, there's other messes. <laughs> but Haas is so good at finding that perfect storm of messes that it all just <laughs> kind of like tumbles so i think there are plenty of other messes going on and you know if other teams just really don't get their setup right it could very be possible but i also think all of those things can definitely still very much happen at haas yeah i think other teams to look at that could end up slowest 
uh, that aren't named Haas are the steak. F1 car doesn't mm -hmm. look fast, and we didn't but expect it looks them green. to be. It's it does okay, look okay because it's green. <laughs> It's slow, let me revise. But it's let me revise that statement. The Stake F1 car looks fast, but isn't actually going very fast. Um, and it's I think green. we because it's green and it does look like a cool fast car. Uh, but I think that those were the two teams that we thought were going to compete for P9 and P10 in the constructors. Uh, Williams had an awful testing in terms of reliability reasons, so Williams could end up being maybe not slower on pace, but end up in the first stretch of races with a string of bad results Issues, that sets them yeah. back behind Haas. Um, and then there is a dark horse, which is there are some people saying that Alpine might actually be the slowest car. Yeah, this is karma um, for the lack of pink on their livery. It's all just coming back to bite them. But we, we were kind of um, anticipating this a little bit. I mean, seeing from their launch, Everyone looked miserable to be there. It just hasn't been an ideal, like, testing situation for them. Uh, that would be pretty rough to see Alpine fall, but I wouldn't... I don't think I would necessarily be shocked after the amount of difficulties they had last season, kind of going into this year, and the, like, entire overhaul that was internally, administration-wise. Like, who knows what's going on in the in the... Haas house. I mean, in the Haas house, but also in the yeah, that too. House. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's just a bad place to be when I say that it feels like organizationally, if I needed to plot the positive or negative trajectory of teams, it feels like Haas is at least flat after changing out from Gunther Steiner to their new team principal. Alpine just feels like it can't get worse, and it just keeps getting worse. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It just does. It feels like it's a complete like dumpster fire. I don't know how it keeps going and going. It will be a, a, a true test this weekend. Yeah. So you think that Haas will still be the slowest car on the grid? I do. Um, I think because of our measurements of slowest car, a lot of times we'll come down to quality laps. It will be easier to measure. Um, I don't think Haas will be the slowest car on the grid this week. I think someone else will take that crown. I don't necessarily think it's Alpine. But that does lead to the next question, which is, do you think Alpine will make Q2 this weekend? I don't think so. I I, I really think it's going to be a both tough cars. One. You think both cars will be out in Q1? I no. I think I think I think one. I don't know who. I mean, I have manifesting who I want, but now I don't want to say things out loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be the entire season of Nicole, like afraid to like say her opinions on the podcast where we give that our I have opinions. opinions. No, because now, okay, but here where I'm going to say this, that SD bestie, I want to see him making it to Q2. And now if he doesn't, it's going to be my fault because I just spoke it out into the universe. No offense, Pierre. I just have an allegiance and you have to pick one for drivers. I'm going to go with one. I think there's definitely going to be a little bit of struggle and things and with... Uh, I just always point blame at Pierre for places. So I'll, I, I don't see both making it through it. I think they're in for a rough weekend. So maybe saying both felt too harsh in, in the get go, if that's really what my gut was screaming. So I'll give them, I'll give them SD bestie and Q2, but I don't think it's. Gonna be a... I don't know. Things seem like such a tire fire over at Alpine right now that you putting one of the cars into Q2 feels worthy of the hope alarm. Like it, Really feels like such a mess. Like There's just rumors. makes it. Like just right. makes it. In. Like there are rumors that more engineers are leaving. There's rumors that that Renault's just going to give up on the entire project. And they're going to sell the team and just leave F1. Like things are so bad that it genuinely feels hope alarm worthy for you to be like, someone's going to make it into Q2. Yes. I'm like, nah, both of those cars are going to be out in Q2. The Alpine, if any, if I want to put money on any team just having a sad weekend, it just feels like Alpine's the car. <laughs> Alpine just literally as soon as free practice starts. <laughs> Here's an interesting one. Will both RB Junior cars score points this weekend? I think yes. I think we have the RB Juniors both scoring points. I think that was a little bit of the surprise of testing. It was like, huh, 
it seems like this could actually be in a place to finish to gain points, which was a big upgrade from last year. I mean, it obviously the Visa V carb zero, whatever the heck it's named was very similar <laughs> looking to RB19 and similar qualities, like other cars on the grid. And but, every other car on the grid, but yeah. I, right. Yeah. Right. But it's different when it's RB and RB. And I think starting out the year with like Daniel Ricardo and being able to work with him, you know, from last season and in the off season, stuff like that, I think does give them a little bit more of an advantage and they've been with Yuki for a while. So at least I don't necessarily think it's going to put them anywhere, you know, beyond the mid of the mid, but I think it can put them in the points. Both cars scoring points feels like someone really dropped the ball or there's a dnf we don't expect like because there always is going to be very possible yeah yeah and this is where my brain starts doing the math where okay if unless checo really starts the season off on a wrong foot theoretically both red bulls should be in the points both ferraris both mercedes because i still think they're the third fastest team so all right you have six cars there then you have mclaren and aston martin and i think aston martin would have really had to drop or mclaren really would have to drop so like you get to 10 cars pretty fast before like you saying that both rb jr scoring points to me makes me think that you think they're jumping two of our top five teams comfortably and that they're going to be the fourth or fifth fastest team on the grid and i think that's would be shocking, but not impossible based on what we've seen in testing. I think it's more of a guess based on, well, I guess then that's also me believing that they're not going to have the reliability issues that I foresee other top like, right. like I can't having, make predictions but I do foresee based on <laughs> potential. Like I can't make predictions like based, right. Like who am I to say, based on what we saw in testing, the only team that I can confidently say I'm worried about reliability is Williams because they genuinely had reliability issues in testing. I, I'm going for it. I'm going for the chaos. Yeah. I just, I, there's just something that I, I feel in the air that's weird about it. I'm going with both in the points and we'll, We'll see. I mean, it, that's the thing about that first race week. We'll, we'll see. It may be a big surprise. Right. Now, I, I was debating with you back for the point of debating back. I do believe it, one of the cars will score points. I just think yeah. they're going to be at that like fringe end where like you just have like one or two, like you don't get both your cars in. I don't think they're going to comfortably be in that top group where it's like both cars should be scoring points all the time. Like, I'd be shocked if they improved that much. But I think they seem to have improved enough where Yuki was always, oh, seemed to always be a P11 in every race. He's, He's just right always in P11. There. Yeah, so I feel like they've improved their car enough that, like, maybe they can come out on the right end of that, like, final point battle. I don't know. I'm... I've manifested some weird points magic of of claims in the past of Maybe Alex Albon last year was my like magic thing. And this year, for some reason, I'll have some sort of like RB prediction power of both in the points. I don't know. Something in my gut is saying it's possible. Final overheated question. Will there be a team in quali within half a second of Red Bull, in your opinion? No. No, I don't. I think I think half a second would be generous. I think maybe 0.7 is where I think the closest we'll get. Boo. I know, I know. I I didn't say I want that to happen. I felt the boo coming. Yeah, me, 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 I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna hit all of our sad. <laughs> like, hey, uh, I I think my brain is telling me I agree with you. My heart is saying that I think Ferrari will be within a half a second, like five tenths. Like that is such a huge gap. The RB20 and the RB19, I'm assuming the RB20 was designed similarly to the RB19 and where they really cared about race pace and they didn't, even though it was a beast in qualifying, it was kind of where teams could be like kind of close. And then the race started and it was like, bye Max. Like, I'm just assuming that they designed their car with a similar philosophy this year. So I'm going to uh, be hopeful. And I'm going to say that Ferrari will be within a half a second of Red Bull in quality. I take it. I'll take it. 
Uh, yep, yep. Because there's still we, who I, there's still so much of the RB19 that we still don't know what it could have done, and that this is more advanced. Who knows? It's gonna fly. It's legitimately just gonna lift off the track and fly away. But it would I, it'd be great to see it. I'm I'm just trying to manage expectations, and I'm excited to see the rest of the battle. But manage expectations. So do you remember last season when Mercedes brought their upgrades to Spain and it was when they finally abandoned the zero pod and then everything like really went well and we threw a party like we yes. popped champagne. I'm saying right now that next week's episode, if someone just is fast enough to be in the pit window of the Red Bull, which means that the Re that Max can't pit and come out in first still, I think we should throw a party. <laughs> it's the little things. It is completely and totally. Yeah. I think but that, it, it would it would dramatically change our enjoyment of would. the race if Max had to pit out behind someone. Yeah, because it's because then at least we need like to watch him pass someone. Have to be watching yeah. exactly. So right. yeah, sounds like a great reason to celebrate. Right. So I I am promising everyone, you Nicole, and everyone listening and watching Gridwalk right now, that I will pop a bottle of champagne if in the Bahrain GP Max has to. Not because of some accident or some weirdness with the safety car, but if like genuinely on pace, someone's in the pit window, I will. Champagne. We got it. We'll celebrate. Expect balloons. Thanks down for that. <laughs> we are recording. One of my biggest fears is to like not realize that we're not recording. And so then recording. We... Do the whole thing. <laughs> Do the whole segment. And then I'm like, Nicole, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't have phone. to stress in season one when you were in charge of hitting the button. The F1 Academy is so fun. I'm loving I, the first official season of F1 Academy, and it hasn't even started yet. Yeah, there hasn't even been racing yet, but I just don't think I'm ever going to get sick of announcements of these new partnerships, because anything that's entering the motorsports space, but particularly F1 Academy, thus supporting females in the motorsports space, like I get super jazzed about and excited, and especially when it's brands that I support or brands that could lead to a really cool livery or race suit or activations. Yes. Like it's every single announcement has hit the nail on the head so perfectly. So at this point, upon recording this, we've had the Charlotte Tilbury announcement. So Charlotte Tilbury is uh, sponsoring one driver on the grid and there's an entire livery and activation along with it. Then we got Puma after that, which is an, the same treatment. A drive, they're sponsoring a particular driver, a livery on the grid. And then finally, we got Tommy Hilfiger this week, which same thing. There's a specific driver with a Tommy Hilfiger livery. And I think this is so smart, considering you already have the 10 teams on the grid having to sponsor a specific driver, and there's a livery. And I think we were kind of wondering, Red Bull ended up sponsoring an additional driver, but there were going to be four drivers on the grid that didn't like have, have the something team association right. and then uh sponsorships are so important for motorsport series because it's a very expensive sport so it is genius in my opinion for the team on, of working on f1 academy Susie wolf as the lead to be recruiting brands as partners and giving them cars so the money they're going in is specifically going to give them a livery a presence on the grid and it is three brands like I cannot rave enough about the three brands we know so far are all consumer product goods. And what that means is it's, it's, a, it's a physical good. Um, a cup is a good. My microphone is a good. And consumer product means it's a, like you and me can go out and buy the thing. And that is just so much more fun than a business uh, software solution, which is important, and you might be targeting it. But me, as a fan, hi, me, I will get so much more excited about a Charlotte Tilbury makeup that I use, or a Puma, who, which shoes I wear every day. Like, I don't wear Tommy Hilfiger, but I can still be excited at the prospect of it. Yeah, this is different when you are a customer that you have a relation with the physical products because you use them every day in your routine. They're part of your wardrobe. They're, you know, your makeup every single day. I mean, like we are so excited about Charlotte Tilbury things because half of my morning routine is Charlotte Tilbury stuff. I, it, it, you can almost be closer to the brands when it's, you know, consumer product goods like this, because it, you have such a different type of relationship and it's just a different part of your everyday life. And it is, 
you know, a business software. It, it, it's such a real physical thing. Um, so having that, it, it's part of your life. And now it's a sponsor with beautiful liveries. Right. And as someone who really wants to support F1 Academy and in uh, make it a success for all the things that it's going for, I love that it's bringing on brands that I can support those brands. And I can say, hey, Charlotte Tilbury, I'm going to keep buying your makeup because I keep seeing you in F1 Academy. Puma, I was maybe going to buy a pair of Nikes, but maybe next shoes I bought will be Pumas again because I like that they're supporting this thing I like. So I love that I feel like I can make a physical, tangible impact and show them that their marketing is working because they're supporting the things I like. And this is, uh, we should have started this all out. You and I both work in marketing, so our brains are very much wired this way, where I love when brands I like invest in things I like, and their whole intention is, hey, if we invest here and then the audience sees us, then they're going to buy our stuff. And I like consciously making the decisions to support brands that support things that matter to me. Because then it feels like I am also supporting and funding the things that I like. Particularly with these three brands, too, they have such opportunity for like large activations throughout the season particularly i mean i'd love to see like what charlotte tilbury does at any race you know miami gp would be really fun to see i'm ex particularly intrigued to see if puma and tommy hilfiger will do anything kind of cross with f1 academy and f1 since they mm -hmm. are in both you know, they can be doing something with F1 and, you know, Mercedes as Tommy Hilfiger or Puma has, you know, their lines across both. So maybe their next merch drop line will be including F1 Academy drivers and F1 drivers. So it's interesting to be seeing what activation opportunities that we're going to have with, you know, a makeup company that doesn't necessarily have, hasn't necessarily been present in motorsports before and what they think is a great way to be interacting with their consumers at these events or in the city where races are and brands that have previous experience with working in motorsports and how they're able to support and lift F1 Academy by doing, you know, different types of act activations wherever. Like, are we going to get Tommy Hilfiger paddock fits from F1 Academy drivers? I would love that. Um, Puma will do uh, store pop-ups at various races because Puma has stores globally at different cities that F1 races in. I would love to see the Puma do a big store event and include their F1 teams and their F1 Academy drivers that overlap with that. Um, for context, I believe Ferrari, Mercedes, Williams for sure are all Puma. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, and I believe Stake, or did Stake go away from it because they're no longer Alfa Romeo? That one's up in the air. I don't know. But at least the three I mentioned, I know are Puma teams on the grid. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, I'm now I'm thinking back to my trip to the flagship store. Catch that vlog on our socials if you didn't see that already of like what merch was uh, upstairs. But that's, yeah, that's yeah. The, the three. Nicole saw the Williams car at the flagship New York City I store. Did, it I was so cool. The, I saw the Williams yeah. car. I bought the show! I like it was like man, I bought a team kit. <laughs> yeah. This is my Williams merch. I think that it is uh, something we need to talk about before we move on from the subject is just how well the announcement strategy and the rollout for F1 Academy has been. The I think it was better than every team livery car launch thing we saw from an F1 team this year, where. Uh, they let the teams handle the announcement of their own drivers, but F1 Academy's rollout of these three cars with their liveries and then the additional content they produced with the brands was so well produced and did such a great job at getting fans hyped. I've seen multiple people say on our content and on other content that they liked F1 Academy's announcements more than they liked F1's this year. So this is not a unique thought or feeling that we're having. And I think so much of that comes down to the way their content strategy worked out. And it's already, for me, that makes me so excited because it's already showing these three brands the value that working with F1 Academy is. Like it could have been so easy for them to just put out a press release and just say Puma is working with us now, but instead they went that extra mile of like, let's make this really cool content with the driver, with the livery, with the helmets, uh, 
the interview they did with Charlotte Tilbury herself talking about why this was so such a big deal for them to partner up, um, going to the Puma store to uh, for that video, like it was such a smart announcement strategy and rollout that was designed to get us excited and it worked. And to your point of like, look, like when in the Charlotte Tilbury interview, I felt like every single one of these announcements came with not just, you know, your traditional press release, but you're getting statements from both sides about why they see this as a beneficial investment into each other. And you really got to see that with the Charlotte Tilbury announcement with the photos of Susie and Charlotte Tilbury together. And like, Mm -hmm. but, and everything immediately being backed up with these like six shots of the helmets with the driver. And it's not just like a mock model and you don't know who's under the helmet. Like you're seeing it on track and you're seeing it there. You're seeing it live, no renderings. Like it's, it is a real thing that you like, this is showing fans be excited because you're going to see this exact thing on the track. And this is this driver and this is the opportunity that it means. And it's, it's so upfront and in your face with the strategy of like, we're very aware of the situation. So we'll be in your face with these big brands because we know that's the difference that it makes. Right. It's really showcasing how you can create value for your partners. And I am sure that it is more financially beneficial to sponsor F1 Academy than it is to sponsor an F1 team. And I think right now these three brands are getting more exposure via this than being on a team kit of an F1 team right now, just based on the content value that's being created. We'll see how that holds up through the season. I'm not I'm not guaranteeing that in perpetuity, but just looking at launch and announcement season, like these three brands got a huge win. Based Beautiful on buzz. Exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Before we move on from talking about F1 Academy, they are not racing this weekend at uh, the Bahrain GP, but their first race is next race weekend at the Saudi Arabia GP. Uh, we are going to be putting out a full F1 Academy preview episode to get you excited and hyped for the season, but also give you all the information you need to know about how the race weekends work. Every single driver on the grid, we're going to give you a bio and a preview about so you can know what their racing background is and uh, how to root for them essentially like you get to pick your favorite driver um and then we do our first f1 academy draft which is similar to our f1 prediction so you'll have to tune in to see how we draft and because of course we have to make everything a fun competition um of course so that is going to be coming out next monday if you're listening to this uh during bahrain gp race weekend uh it's going to come out on all of our normal channels so youtube and wherever you look at your podcast, we'll be posting about it on our social media. But make sure you check that out. Quack, 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 quack. Oh, I didn't upload the quack. Put any quacks needed in post. Quack, 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 quack. I'd like to be, I have to like Velcro this. I think that's going to be what the next move is oh, the, the duck of to your shoulder. Duck. instead of it sitting here i think it has to evolve although that is cute i think you should um buy like a box of rubber duckies and just like every week con- more <laughs> just ducks should be added. adding just more ducks yeah. until i'm just right. overrun with ducks right and then he then next season there will no longer be uh, there's like, no duck ducks period. right <laughs> uh, quack, well quack. as i said <laughs> I love this segment. Um, As we said in uh, the formation lap, uh, everyone was in the same place and everyone was talking, discussing the fact that Lewis Hamilton is moving to Ferrari. I feel like I heard every random human who just walked through the paddock's opinion about the fact that Lewis went to Ferrari. And the reality is, I don't think I actually heard a lot of Lewis Hamilton's opinion. Or actually Ferrari managed to really duck a lot of these questions, Um, or at least they didn't give any interesting quotes. So after a week of everyone being back in the paddock together, knowing that we have a Lewis Hamilton in a lame duck Mercedes season, um, has anything changed your mind or have you learned anything new about how this all went down that you feel like is vital to talk about? No, it kind of just seems still very like, oh, it was surprise. I as I said off pod, I was like, wow, Lewis didn't just like, you know, he didn't get tell his parents. And he's like, he really made this decision like for himself and like that I respect, but I, I feel like I kind of already knew that. And he made that very clear with his previous announcements. All of it still seems very like, uh, this is the same. Nothing earth shattering was shared over the course of the weekend. 
coming from the perspective of I care about Lewis Hamilton's voice on this a lot. Um, I care about uh, wanting to hear what Toto Wolf will say about it. And I want to hear what Fred Vassour is going to say about it. Um, and that's kind of the extent of it <laughs> where um, I felt like there were a lot of opinions and a lot of hot takes, but Lewis held strong to his PR quotes and his words um, because I, Lewis has never been the type of driver to come out and just like flame anyone publicly. So I don't, I didn't expect Lewis to be like, yeah, Mercedes didn't want me. So I'm going to Ferrari. Like I didn't expect him to like all of a sudden pull a Fernando Alonso where he gives us some like hot, crazy take like that and just be completely honest with us. So he said he like, why did he make the change? Well, I made it for me. It's like, yeah, we can all read between the lines there, but he's not really telling us anything new. There's no dirt. No dirt right. there. Yeah, and he's very good at, you know, spinning it as uh, I'm doing this for me, and there's, like, you know, expanding the opportunity of diversity and that he sees there that he'll have, like, a better chance of being able to do that there, which is very interesting, considering that we're talking about Ferrari of all places. But that's what he's sticking with and we'll see if we get more you know as the season goes on depending on what happens internally with mercedes and as you know lewis continues to speak more about it as his time at mercedes comes to an end and uh but at least with everyone back and all the quack 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 at the exact same time we could have it's pretty quiet yeah this is going to end up in Lewis's book when he retires. Like, I don't even think we're going to get the full story from him until after he's out of the Ferrari. Like, this is going to be a while until we really hear from him what's going on. Uh, I thought another winner of the PR management of this all is I thought Ferrari handled this very well. Like, they're, which is shocking for me to say. Like, normally I'm not here. Like, Ferrari's PR management was great. But, like, I thought Charles said all the right things. I thought... Fred Vassour said all the right things about redirecting the attention to this year. I thought Carlos Sainz handled it very well, saying that his focus on, like, I, he felt very believable in he was being honest about the fact that he's looking for another seat while not distracting from Ferrari. Like, they really, mm -hmm. Ferrari was buttoned up in a PR department in a way that I am not accustomed to. It felt very not Ferrari. Um, it did feel very much, I mean, I guess besides like the Carlos piece, I wouldn't see like applying to this, but like the whole Ferrari of like, we got Lewis, let's not mess this up. And let's really like make sure this is a clean release and we're going to be really classy and official about this. And we're not going to let any emotion seep through. And we're just going to maintain the message of focus on this year. Excited to have Lewis join us in 2025. And like, that's kind of it. Like really clean, have not wavered on that at all. And it's they could impressive. have very easily done a victory lap. They could be bragging. They could be celebrating. They could be calling this year a wash. Like everything about this year is for next year. And like, we might hit a point in the season where they are like, hey, our goal was always next year. Anyway, that's why we're bringing in Lewis. Like this year was all, and I think that is probably a reality, but they, I was We don't impressed. need that narrative yet. We're not, yeah, we're not there, we're not there yet. yet. Right yet. now, Ferrari, it's still in the arsenal. We don't need to, we don't need to whip that out right. yet. So right now, we're still focused on 2024. This is our year. Closing the gap. This. Really yeah. believe in it. Here for the team. What's year up? Two 2025. Who? Yeah. yeah. Better. Yeah. Like, we he was so good at redirecting it to like, oh, we started these changes last year, and here's the progress we're gonna make on race strategy this year. And like, like Fred Russell was like, hey, here are the things you normally talk to me about. Let me make quotes about that. And then you'll distract from not asking the Lewis question. Look over here. <laughs> like yeah. it's and there's enough always going on with Ferrari for you to be like, oh, yeah, I do want to look over there. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I you were actually telling us about this right now. Yeah, sure. I yeah, guess cool. we'll ignore the biggest news ever. I felt like the loser in the PR management uh, charade of this all was Mer the Mercedes side of this. They very much, their PR strategy left m me getting the impression that they felt like a scorned ex-boyfriend. And yeah. I do think they just, of all the groups, uh, had the least time to prepare how to handle this. And you can feel it. I was about to say, I think a lot of that came from the timing of it all. If, you know, from Lewis's quotes, from everything we've got from Mercedes, it did. I mean, Toto was like, I found out the day before we had breakfast. and nothing. Like, it, it does even seem like it was just those days leading up to it. And it, 
it was a little bit of a scramble and I can, I mean, gosh, I never hope in my entire career I have to deal with some kind of like releasing of that type of statement and that kind of like earth shattering news happening, but it definitely seems like it could have been held better. And I, especially given that there was like a lot of speculation already about, you know, Lewis's relationship with the team and kind of how like that atmosphere was going at the end of last season and then kind of for this to be happening when it's happening and like, you know, before the testing, before like preseason testing even began, like just really sent a lot of like red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. And they had to get all their statements out. They had to say something. And when you have Sky Sports, you know, reporting and broadcasting so that you can outside of the factory to the point where even like we can watch it in America, like it's a lot of eyes, it's a lot of coverage. And I just don't think that they necessarily chose their words the best and timing the best and you know controlling of certain quotes could have been better but yeah i I think the like if you saw preseason testing as the first temperature check and test of what these lame duck years are going to be like in ferrari and mercedes i would say i think ferrari is at least going to be fine for the first half of the season i think Unless that car is fast, everything will be okay. And by fast, I mean can compete with Red Bull. Um, the I left the weekend feeling like this is going to be a really hard year as a Lewis Hamilton fan. And like Mercedes is going to throw a temper tantrum constantly. And that's just, and I think that's down to just Mercedes kind of poor PR management of the situation and them still, to your point, reeling about it, like, because they were the uninformed party, like this was dropped on their lap. So I don't blame them for not having it all together so much, even though I'm sure they pay a bunch of people a lot of money to have it all together. But you can't control the fact that Toto Wolf and George Russell are just going to say whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's just... Uh, I left the weekend feeling nervous as a Lewis Hamilton fan after even going through last season where it was like, why aren't you supporting your faster driver? Like any small, tiny inkling of hope I had that maybe, maybe, maybe they, if like Lewis is faster, they might give him a little bit of preference on the race. Like It's just, it's not happening. Out like the there's, nope. yeah, the sour feelings are sour, sour. But like, you know, maybe give the greatest driver of all time the contract he wants and then you wouldn't be in this situation. So I feel I feel no remorse on Mercedes behalf. I agree. Not that hard. Just all you have to do. It is time for Gridwalk to attempt to predict an F1 race result with zero on track data. This will definitely go well. Gridwalk's race weekend predictions. First predictions of the season. Whoop, 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 whoop. Race week predictions. I can't believe we're already here. I mean I'm a lot warmer than when I did my predictions, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so every week we are going to make predictions for the race week. Uh, we put out this episode on Thursday, which means that we always make the predictions, as Voiceover Man said, with no on-track data. So just give you that disclaimer that you're going to be getting these predictions before even an FP1 happens. So. Uh, we do our best. We actually do a decent amount of research into this. We know a lot of stuff, but, eh, you know, and rub the crystal ball. Uh, <laughs> going into the first race week of the year, and we're only going <laughs> off uh, testing, and who knows how reliable that information is and what will happen this weekend after, you know, free practice and qualifying and everything like that. So take this with a grain of salt. But it's still fun, and we like to make predictions. Um, But because how predictable F1 got last year with who won the race, uh, we no longer pick P1 because we got tired of saying Max Verstappen every week. But F1 has not been predictable with all the other placements behind Max Verstappen. So every week, we're going to pick the following things for our predictions. Uh, We are going to say who we think is going to get pole. Who's going to be P2 on the podium? Who's going to be P3 on the podium? Who's going to be P10 last in the points? And what is going to be the highest scoring team not named Red Bull? But RB Jr. is allowed to participate in that. They are they do count, just Red Bull Sr. does not count. Um, every single prediction we get right, we get a point for. And at the end, we'll probably... TBD, depending on how much of a lead one of us gets, um, we'll probably cut this off around summer break and restart for the second half of the season like we did last year. 
Nicole lost the predictions last season, and the stakes that were on the line was that she had to do her first predictions of the 2024 season from an ice bath. So let's go watch Nicole do that. This is just so ridiculous. And it just, it felt as ridiculous as it looks. All right, let's get this over with. Hello from my bathroom. This is weird. Okay, hold on. Last F1 season's prediction battle. Brianna beat me. And my punishment is to give you my prediction for the Bahrain GP from an ice bath. I will be doing this in clothes. The internet's a weird place. The worst part about this is honestly that this was my idea. Shout out Carlos. Wow. Here's the duck. We're going to do this so fast. We're going to predict the fastest that we've ever predicted anything in our lives. We're getting in. We're getting in. We're getting in. It is cold. It is cold. It is unbelievably cold. Why do drivers do this? Why do drivers do this? Okay. On pole. Holy bull. This is it. This is all I'm doing. Pole. Max Verstappen. P2. Charles. P3. Checo. P10. Less than the points, Yuki. Um, most none. Woo! Not Red Bull with the most points is Ferrari. I cannot feel my legs. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. So some behind the scenes, you need to know that Nicole said, oh my God, for about 30 more seconds, but I had to cut it out on the edit. And my absolute favorite part was you missing the camera angle when you originally threw the rubber ducky in. I will not get over that. Yeah, missingly, uh, initially, uh, just completely missing the angle to include the rubber ducky. I mean, I had full intention of, like, my camera was set up so that if you sat in the bathtub like a normal person, like, the angle would be great. As soon as I, like, sat down, my legs couldn't move. I was like, there's no way I could put these straight. I, like, it is, my brain forgot how to use muscles, and it really wasn't until I said everything that I was like, oh, I should put my, like, legs straight. I could not. I was absolutely frozen. You remembered all of your predictions and said them all correctly. Like, I was fully expecting you to, like, send me a message. Like, hey, I said so-and-so driver, but I meant to say this. I had them written in, like, the biggest font on my computer screen. Like, that, like, a grandma could read. It's like that, you know, when your parents are, like, reading their text messages on their iPhone and it's, like, this big on the bubble as the whole screen. Like, that is exactly what I was doing for my predictions. Um... There is a it's longer I, cut of this, so if anyone wants the longer cut of this, you just have to let us know. Now that we've all seen that joyful chaos that was joyful for everyone except Nicole, um, <laughs> I, th I have to give my predictions, and I think, Nicole, you should reiterate your predictions in a non-panic state as well. So starting with uh, Nicole, remind everyone, who did you pick for poll this weekend? I have Max Verstappen up poll. Um, not surprising. I went with the safe option for the first race of the season. And I also looked into my crystal ball and said, I see a certain Dutchman named Max Verstappen getting pulled. Oh. Picking these predictions before we see any on-track data always feels like looking into a magical crystal ball where I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I don't think we need to say a lot about why we think Max Verstappen is going to be on pole. Yeah, odds just felt likely. It, you know, I debated for a second maybe putting Charles here, but at least it felt like, based on what I feel, but enough confidence in that Max on pole seems like a good way for me to get points. Right, right. I don't feel like it's going to be that way for the entire season. So I don't think this is going to be one of the things we chuck out like when we used to predict who would win the race. But the first right. one, I think it's, yeah, we start with Max. Right. I have to see what's going on first before I confidently select someone else. All right, Nicole, who did you pick again in coherent fashion now for P2? Charles Leclerc. And your P2? Sergio Perez. Um, and I think before we discuss this, uh, Nicole, what did you pick for P3? Sergio Perez. And who did you pick for P3? Charles Leclerc. And I really, I think the difference between whether you put Checo P2 or P3 was how much you personally feel like he has his head on straight mixed with how much faster do you think the RB20 is than the rest of the field. Right, like, because I think Max is definitely going to be faster than Checo, and then it's like, 
But if the RB20 is even more of a rocket ship than the RB19, then Checo should be comfortably P2. If Checo really did take the offseason to like kind of recalibrate and like, uh, it's a big reset. should be. Big right. should be. He should be P2. And I've decided for my first set of race predictions to lean into those those inevitabilities. Like, I really do believe that he probably took the offseason to, like, reset. He started last season pretty great. He should, like, look, the RB20 just looks so much faster than the rest of the field. If he is not P2 and that is the case, like, swap him out for someone fast yeah, for my we'll personal enjoyment. We'll we'll see if there if there's been any work, but until then, I was like, all right, I can go and give myself some happiness, and I'd love to see a Charles in a P two right now. I mean, in a year, this is not going to be something I'm going to want to be predicting anymore. So I'm leaning into my Charles girly energy while I still can. And clearly, based on this, we both think that Ferrari is going to be the second fastest team on the grid. Uh, we both left preseason testing with that assumption, which is interesting. Neither of us are throwing in a Mercedes or a McLaren, or it's like, like you're feeling confident that Ferrari is that second fastest team as well. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely Ferrari, the first team that's not Red Bull with the most points. That's 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 my pick for sure. Uh, it is also my pick that the highest scoring team not named Red Bull is Ferrari. And I don't think it's always like, I don't always feel like whatever driver I put on the podium with the two Red Bulls is the, the winner of that. But yeah, I just, I feel like leaving preseason testing, the vibes were the most positive around Ferrari. Like it seemed like that they garage, had the garage, the like right. the just the how the way the press was going, the way that you know testing just went for them overall, the vibes just feel that that's it feels like famous last words that this could be cut into something later. Vibes feel better at Ferrari and more right. optimistic. Right, like it it just also since we're picking the highest scoring team not named Red Bull, like it just Ferrari ended last season positively overall. Um, even though they didn't end up catching Mercedes, but that was more down to DNFs, crashes, things like that than anything else. Um, it just, Mercedes feels like their car is a bigger reset, like they're starting more mm -hmm. from scratch. So it just feels like Ferrari has a more, of all the teams on the grid, it feels like Ferrari has the most stable footing underneath them, even though their car made a big concept change too. And yeah, it, it felt silly saying that out loud. You made this face, for those of you not watching on YouTube, Nicole made this face when I said that Ferrari feels the most stable of all the other teams. That <laughs> just was like, you know, I'm just, I'm just buying into the Fred Vasseur hype. Like, he is just making me feel good. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't explain it either, but you're so right. There's something about that Frenergy. Like, it's just... Wait, wait, I don't have, I don't have any sounders that are relevant to that because something deserves, hold on. For energy, yes. <laughs> Whoop. That was fantastic. Uh, we do have one more thing we need to predict here. Last in the points. Uh, yeah, P10, last in the points. Who do you have? I have Mr. Yuki Sonoda in P10. Who do you have? I went a similar route uh, with the RB Junior team, but I have Daniel Ricardo. Ooh. I made some really hot takes before about how I was claiming that both rb juniors will be in the points and to follow through with that claim i'm sticking with the chaos and i put yuki in p10 because then my brain has danny rick somewhere a little bit higher and is this why i had to take an ice bath maybe but at least i'm here to have fun i'm here to have fun too no, not that <laughs> I put you're daniel not ricardo here. in the points yeah and i apparently have daniel ricardo in like a p8 situation going on like this is this one's always so hard to predict. I feel like who always like it's always like some team or driver that just like scrapes into the bottom points because some faster team above dropped the ball. Like it's just like, but 
it becomes like the, one of the most fun things to be watching yes. during a race. And especially like, again, hi, welcome to Gridwalk, where we like to give you stories up and down the entire grid. When you're so focused on a bet of getting P, who's in P10, and that sometimes can really come down to those last final ri- like laps of a race. Oh boy, is F1 the most exciting so thing. Fun. So pick yes. a driver, estimate your P10, and there you go. You're in for an exciting race. Um, and for this reason, this year, we're going to put a prediction template with the five, thing we're pre- five things we're predicting on our social media, uh, well, on our Instagram at Gridwalk Show. And we highly recommend use the template, tell us who you're predicting, join in on this with us. Because to Nicole's point, like when you have an extra vested interest of like, who's going to be on P3 and who's going to be P10 or who's the highest scoring team, it becomes... Like Nicole and I spent so much of the race just texting each other about P10. And you wouldn't think about that because it's not like, like I personally am like, oh, I need Daniel Ricardo to get this specific position. But now, now I do feel that yeah, way. Yeah, we need P10. <laughs> yes. And they all, they, people fight for that last bit of points. And it's very special. And guess what? If you participate, you won't have to take an ice bath if you're wrong. You just really get to be in it for the fun. It's the final lap hitting every F1 garage. Get ready for this week's Yellow Sector Notes. GQ Sports continues its content streak with different F1 drivers. It released a video of George Russell's 10 favorite things, and we learned that George Russell uh, likes to be the DJ of gatherings. Ferrari's Ferrari Style Line had their fashion show in Milan this week. McLaren extended its Google sponsorship contract. Maybe we'll see uh, another Ferris wheel at the British GP, TVD. Um, Aston Martin has a very, had a very quiet preseason, and both drivers gave quotes that made it seem like they're going to come out of the gates much slower than last season. So know where your expectations. That's actually why we haven't been talking a lot about Aston Martin. So there doesn't seem to be a lot going on. Um, Alpine is going to be pink this week. And if you're not watching YouTube, I said it that way and I put air quotes that they are saying they're going to be pink this week, but we have their cars black, so whatever. Um, Alex Albon has an app now, and it gives you a funny nickname if you sign up. Uh, RB Jr. came out and denied reports that it's going to be moving its headquarters to Red Bull's Milton Kings location, but all of this seems to be a matter of semantics because a new facility is being readied, and they are, quote, relocating some of its current UK staff to a new building in Milton Kings. So essentially, their headquarters in name will definitely stay in Italy, but they're going to be moving a bunch of its already based UK staff to Milton Kings, and they probably could move more staff there. So uh, I, I feel like we're having a semantics conversation. Yep, their headquarters won't be with Red Bull, but they will be working in the same factory as Red Bull. Do with that as you will. Um, in much more exciting news, Joe Guan Yu's cat has an Instagram account. Go follow it, please. It's so cute. He really has the cutest cat. It's like, I don't, I'm not a cat person. I'm very much a dog person. I am so allergic to cats, but I would take my eyes getting puffy for that cat. It is so cute. And last but not least, Gunther Steiner will be back in the paddock this week. He's going to be a commentator for a German broadcaster, which just feels like a content win all the way around. I didn't want to go through a season without Gunther Steiner content, and we're going to get that, even though he's not going to be the team principal of Haas anymore. And that is the gridwalk for Leap Year, February 29th, 2024, completed, and also the first race weekend. How is my sector time today, Nicole? Faster than the Alpine. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Gridwalk. Thank you to our co-creators, Nicole Katz and Brianna Klein. Thank you to our four-legged executive producers and me, voiceover man. Don't forget to subscribe, like the video, turn on auto downloads, and leave a review to provide us with a fresh set of tires for the next week's show. You can follow us on social media at Gridwalk Show for daily content. We will be back to walk the Formula One grid every Thursday, and we will see you for the post-Gridwalk debrief in the comments. Today felt like an icy Gridwalk. Shout out to you for leaning into the Oh, so cold.